It's good to see you all for our Bible study tonight. We are in our third week or third installment in Psalm 119. So that's where we'll be tonight. Psalm 119, we're going to start in verse 17. And just as a little, just a review, not, well, kind of a review. Uh, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's 176 verses, and it's organized into 22 different sections of eight verses each. And each section, each little stanza of eight verses, corresponds to a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So the Hebrew alphabet is different. Uh, it's unique because there's 22 consonants and no vowels. If you ever looked at a Hebrew Bible, uh, there's a couple of distinct features. One, you read right to left, which is really different. But then there's all these little um, vowel marks. They're not actually vowels, but they're more like clues to sounds. So you take the consonants and there's little symbols and, and dots and things that as you go, it gives you a kind of a prompt for the pronunciation of the word. So uh, it's, it's really different. If, um, if you ever get a chance to look at the Hebrew text, it's, uh, I mean, it, it, if, you, if you've never seen it, it almost looks like somebody's just sitting there drawing, you know, but they're all dis distinct characters and uh, the little um, vowel marks that help with the pronunciation. But so that, that's what we're looking at here. 22 stanzas um, corresponding to the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So the other thing about Psalm 119 is the theme of the whole chapter is all about God's Word. Every single stanza has some kind of a unique, um, I'll, I'll say theme, a unique theme about uh, a, a part of, a characteristic of, or benefit of, the Word of God. So tonight we'll be looking at the third section, which corresponds to the letter Gimel in the Hebrew alphabet, verse 17 to verse 24. And I am relying very heavily on um, my favorite preacher, Johnny Hunt, his work on Psalm 119. So I want to start out with a quote from him about this section. And he says that, the psalmist reminds us that in difficulty and distress, the Lord and his word are a comfort and a counselor. So those two words kind of uh, summarize this particular section, a comfort and a counselor. And interestingly enough, we're going to see how within these eight verses, there's three sections, almost three distinct prayers that the psalmist is offering, praying for specific things. And they all, as I said, they all will revolve around God's Word. So, with that being said, let me read Psalm 119, verse 17 to verse 24, and then we'll talk about uh, those, those things as we move through it. So here's what the Bible says. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Let me pray before we get started. Lord, we thank you for the time we'll share together tonight. Thank you so much for your word. And I pray that you will give us understanding of what we've just read so we can take what you've shown us 
and put it into practice and be obedient to it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, comfort and counsel. Um, Johnny Hunt's title for this particular section, he called it, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Kind of like the song title, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. And you'll see that in verse 18. Literally, open, open my eyes. So, the, I mentioned there might be three distinct prayers offered in this eight-verse paragraph. So, the first one we'll look at is the first two verses. Verse 17 and verse 18 is a prayer for understanding. And, and I'll, I'll preface that by saying all three of these prayers are prayers from, uh, for um, divine help, like, uh, uh, like this one, pray for understanding. Well, pray for understanding from God, from the Holy Spirit. So the first two verses talk about understanding. So you see, uh, especially in verse 17, you, you can already see it's a prayer. He's praying, deal bountifully with your servant. So what does that tell us right off the bat? Deal bountifully with me. What's that mean exactly? So the psalmist is praying for God to be gracious and to be kind and to be generous. When you think about uh, bountiful, that kind of means um, abundance, right? So he's praying for generosity with respect to grace and kindness by giving clarity with the word. So, so think about this. Have you ever been reading the Bible or studying the Bible, having a devotional time or, or whatever it may be, maybe even preparing to lead a Bible study or something like that, and you have prayed, God, help me understand. I, I need to understand what I'm reading so I can faithfully explain it and help, right? You want to help lead people in the right direction. So it's almost as if uh, on a personal level, there's no indication that that there's any kind of teaching involved here. It's just a, a personal prayer request. Lord, please be gracious to me, be kind to me uh, by giving me clarity with your word. And so that's a, a wonderful prayer for all of us to pray but look at the context. Deal bountifully with your servant. Right? So it's not just a, a random request. It's not just any person who's asking for this. It's a servant of God, a self-proclaimed uh, servant. I'm your servant, which means I submit to you. I submit to your leadership. I'm surrendered, uh, and I'm here to do what you want me to do. So how am I going to know what that is? How will I know what God wants me to do? I need to read the word. I need to understand it, right? So we, we talk, this is like a basic concept. We have, we have uh, almost beat this horse to death as far as what's our main goal to be able to live the Christian life. Read the Bible. Read the Bible all the time as much as we can. Read the Bible. Spend time in God's Word. If we want to be obedient to God, we have to know what He's calling us to do. And we have to uh, read the Bible to know what He's calling us to do. And we have to understand it to be able to be truly obedient. So the first verse, deal bountifully with your servant. Now, what's the purpose? It's in the second part. So that I may live. So what does that tell us about the importance of the Word. My life is found through the Word of God. I live because you have dealt bountifully with me. So if we want to talk about living true life, the, full, the most full expression of the Christian life is found in the fact that the Lord would be generous toward us with His grace and kindness, that He would give us understanding illumination is a word maybe that you the spirit will give us understanding of what we've read and it's so that i can live so i can truly live but also you see the last part of that verse 17 that i may live and keep your word so my life prospers through obedience to your word and a little side note if my life prospers in my obedience to God's word, and it's God who enables my obedience, 
right? Because we don't just pray for understanding. We pray for um, application. So we're praying not only that God would give us understanding, but that he would strengthen us to be able to obey. Because I'll just be honest, and I'm sure maybe some of you, if not all of you, could um, resonate with this. Obedience doesn't always just come naturally. And maybe rarely does it come naturally, right? It's not always easy. Yeah, God, I'll do exactly what you say. No problem. Not necessarily. Uh, oftentimes, our um, our sinful nature just uh, fights against what God's calling us to do. And so we need God to be generous with us, to deal bountifully with us, so that we can have clarity with the word, so we can live, and so that we can be obedient. Now, the reason why we need understanding from God, there's another verse, that, like a reference verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul tells the church, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So think about that. That means apart from the Holy Spirit, we can't figure this stuff out, right? We can't just read it apart from God's intervention in our minds and hearts and lives and think, oh, well, I can figure that out. It's no problem. You ever read something in the Bible that didn't make sense to you? <laughs> yeah, how many times a day, right? Depends on how much you read. And so... Uh, we need the Spirit's help. So you get to verse 18 in this first little section here, praying for understanding. And now here's the second prayer. Open my eyes. Open my eyes so I can see or behold wondrous things out of your law. So now, that's not, uh, that's figurative more than it is literal, right? Because you have to have your eyes open if you're going to read the Word, right? Unless you're reading a Braille Bible, your eyes are open, right? But what's he really saying? Sometimes I can be looking, but not seeing, right? Sometimes I can be looking right at something and just miss it. And so the prayer is, anything that's distracting or hindering or keeping me from seeing what you want me to see Take that away, get it out of my way so I can see clearly, so I can read and hear and understand your word. So with clear, open eyes, I'm able to behold the wonder of God's word. Have you ever read something in the Bible and you just had to pause a minute and just like, wow, that's amazing. That's just, can't even hardly comprehend. Have you ever had that moment? The Bible's open and you read it and you, maybe it's something you've read before, maybe many times, but you read it in a, a different day or a different context, a different situation in your life, and it's just, it's just heavy on you. Open my eyes so I can behold the wondrous things out of your law. John chapter 16, verse 13. Talking about the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all the truth. That's the Holy Spirit's role as our teacher. The Holy Spirit has several things that he does in our lives, and that's one of them, one major thing. He will guide you into all the truth. So we're praying for understanding. We're praying that God would be generous with us in his grace and his kindness, giving us clarity so our life will prosper through obedience and that we'll truly see all the wonderful things in God's Word. So where does that start? Open it, read it. Dedicate time to opening the Bible, sitting with the Word, and ultimately it's sitting with God, spending time with God. So pray for understanding. Number two, pray for satisfaction. This is, this is a big one. Pray for satisfaction. Verses 19 and 20. The psalmist declares, I am a sojourner 
You know what a sojourner is? Traveler, stranger. Um, Here's what that means. This world is not my home. This is a... Uh, This is a very important principle that I believe, I I believe it gets, it gets overlooked, it gets lost a lot of times. Sometimes we, we try to feel at home in the world and we just, sometimes we don't. Well, there, (laughs) I'm not, I'm not making light of this. It's just, it's not funny, but. We shouldn't feel at home in the world. If we belong to Jesus, we should feel very uneasy where we are because this is not our home. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Our citizenship is in heaven from where we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power of that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Our citizenship is not of this world. And the more we try and try and try to fit in on earth, we're just we're fighting a losing battle because we're not meant to fit in. If we belong to Jesus, we're not meant to fit in to the world. We're strangers in a strange land. And so the prayer here in verse 19 is uh, because the world is not my home, I'm a citizen of heaven, don't hide your word from me, right? Don't, I need um, instruction from on high. So the prayer is don't hide your word. Show me your word. Guide me in the heavenly way. Don't hide your commandments from me. Now, we have Scripture, so the word's not hidden. So this prayer is really getting more to the the clarity and the understanding. Don't don't hide it from me. You know, pour it out. Let me let me let me hear it, read it, meditate on it, understand it, and then let me do what it says. C.S. Lewis, in his book *Mere Christianity*, which is unbelievable, um, at one point he makes this statement, and it's often quoted, but it's very appropriate for here. He writes, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. That is the struggle of Christians in the world. We should have this otherworldly desire. And it's a, it's a heavenly desire. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in our hearts, which is why we have desire for the Lord, for his word. It's not going to be met on this earth. It can't be because it's not here. It's there. And so in verse 20, you almost sense this... Uh, This struggle, this uneasiness where the psalmist says, My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Just think about that. My soul is consumed. If you're consumed with something, what's that mean? It means it's always on your mind. You're always thinking about it. uh, you, You just can't get away from it. You're consumed. And what, what's he consumed with? So it's almost like another word for it is I saw in another translation, it said, my soul is crushed. Now think about that. The, the combination of those two words in English, consumed and crushed, it's, it's, um, it's the sense that our most innate desire is not being fulfilled because that, that deep, deep inward desire for the presence of God, it's not being met because we're in a world where we're surrounded by sin and sinfulness all the time. So there's a, a, a consumed feeling, a crushed feeling, my soul and my spirit. And then he says, with longing for your rules. So I'm consumed with longing for your rules. Like my desire, my deepest desire 
is for the Word of God. I just I can't get enough of it because I know the benefit and the value. And so I'm constantly dwelling on this longing for, in, in this text it says, for your rules or for your precepts, your commands, your principles, your testimonies, all those different synonyms for the Word of God. I'm, I'm longing for it all the time. And, and that's a that's a place where we need to get we need to get to that place, you know. We're not necessarily always there, but that's where we want to be, where our soul is consumed with longing for the Word of God. And uh, I hate to put it in these terms, but it, it almost seems as if a shortage or a lack of access to God's Word would probably bring those feelings more to the surface. My oldest daughter was in my office this past week, and just the way her mind works, so she's looking at my book, my bookcases, uh, my bookshelves, and she starts counting different things and looking at different things, and she counted the number of Bibles I have. And I, I was, I mean, just a random thing. And this is, I have one in Portuguese. I have one in Spanish. I have numerous copies in different translations in English. I have an interlinear Bible, which puts the English and the Greek side by side. Um, I've got, I've just, I've got a lot of Bibles. And she's, so she's just started looking all over trying to, and I have them mostly together, but she was counting and I have a couple more that I study out of that I keep on a different shelf so they'll be closer. And so she thought she was done. I said, oh, don't forget about these three over here. And so she's, and so you might want to take a guess how many Bibles I have in my office. And this is not, not electronic, hard copy Bibles. No, not quite. That's, that was on the high side. 25. Got 25 different Bibles it, just in my office. Now, let me put that in context. There are countries in this world where if you have one portion of one book of a Bible in your possession, you'll be in prison. I got... I got 25 Bibles just in my office. I can pick this thing up here and have pretty much instant access to a website that's got 50 different translations of the Bible. Our access to Scripture is basically, I mean, not truly, but basically unlimited. Unhindered. We have unhindered access to the Word of God. Now, let's put that in perspective. Are we in it enough? No. Not even close. Especially when there are people all over the world who would go to great lengths and great sacrifice to have one copy of Scripture in their language for their whole village, that would be a miracle. And I've got 25. Kind of made me feel bad, honestly. Because our desire does not match our access are our souls really consumed with longing for His Word at all times? Because that's what the text says in verse 20. So, pray for satisfaction. Pray for satisfaction. Lastly, number three. This is the final four verses, verse 21 to verse 24. Pray for opposition. This is maybe a little odd, to say it that way, but we're told to pray for our enemies, right? Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting anything in return. 
And so we should be gracious and kind, just as Christ was gracious and kind to the wicked. And so we're praying for opposition. If you look at verse 21, what, how does God um, deal with those who are opposed to him and opposed to his word? Well, the Bible says that they are rebuked, they are insolent, which basically means arrogant. They're cursed, and it's because they wander away from God's commandments. So those who are opposed to God and opposed to his word have these similar characteristics. God rebukes them because they're cursed, they're arrogant, and they wander away from his word. And so in verse 21, you see how that looks, and, and it's more of a statement, not a prayer. But then you get to verse 22, and you see the prayer Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimony. So now the, we saw the description of those opposed to God and his word. Now you see those who follow God and his word and what the prayer is. It's almost as if they're praying for um, peace, acceptance, um, presence, fellowship. Because the prayer is take away the scorn or the reproach from me. Take away the contempt from me. In other words, it's almost as if he's saying, don't treat me like these others who wander away from your commandments. Because he then says in verse 22, for I have kept your testimony. So I'm not like those folks who disregard your word and who wander away from your word. I'm keeping your word. So take away your approach from me. Take away the contempt from me. Don't don't look at me like you look at those who are opposed to you. I'm not opposed to you or to your word. He says, I've kept your testimonies. And then in verse 23, there's two different um, principles of relating to God's word. One in 23 and one in 24. The first one is meditating. And so I've rephrased those verses to tr try to emphasize the, the principle of what's going on. The psalmist writes that I meditate on your statutes even though people plot against me, even though people uh, sit and talk poorly about me, but I'm still meditating on your statutes. So now the emphasis is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meditate on your word despite the persecution or the opposition, despite the fact that people are plotting against me because they know uh, that I stand on your word, or dis despite the fact that they're talking bad about me. Has anyone ever said anything to you that was um, rude or insulting because, specifically because of your belief in God and his word? So, so think about that. Think about the effect that has on a person. When you stand on your convictions and you make it known, I'm a believer in Jesus, I'm following him, I'm reading and, and trying to study and understand and obey the word of God. That's my life focus and direction. And, be, and because of that, and nothing, nothing else, no other reason, but because of that, people will talk bad about you. They'll plot against you. They'll treat you poorly just because of that. And so the psalmist says, I'm meditating on your word even though that's happening. So I'm undeterred. I'm still going to do that. I don't care if people talk bad about me. I don't care if people are plotting against me or treating me poorly, or maybe even unfairly because of my convictions for the word. I'm still going to do it. Right? So it's a... It's almost like a, a prayer, not for opposition in this case, but uh, a prayer to help us deal with opposition. And so the, the, that's verse 23. And then in verse 24, so I meditate on your statutes, even though this is happening. And then I delight in your testimonies because they give me wise counsel. They are my counselor. So the testimonies of God, the words of God are filled with wise counsel. Who here has ever read through the book of Proverbs? Just, yeah. I mean, I did this thing one time where 
my daily Bible reading was reading a chapter of Proverbs every day corresponding with the day of the month. Because I know it's, there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. I know every month doesn't have 31 days, but I would just I would make it work. So if I get to the end, I just read two or three chapters or whatever to make it work. But I'd start on January 1st, I read Proverbs 1, and so on through the month. And you do that for a year, and you get pretty familiar with them. How much wise counsel is just in that one book? Just in just in Proverbs, so much helpful counsel, wise, godly counsel, just in that one book. And so, a fitting into this particular section, your testimonies, your word—that's my—that's what I delight in, because of its wise counsel in my life. So. I'm going to meditate on your statutes, even though I've got people talking about me, even though people are treating me badly or plotting against me. I'm still going to meditate on your statutes, and then I'm going to delight in your, in your word, your testimonies, because of the wise counsel I receive. So just in this one section of eight verses, the prayers for understanding, because it gives us true life, the prayer for satisfaction so we will be consumed with a longing for the Word, and then a prayer for not only opposition but for strength to navigate through life in the midst of opposition. All is found in the Word. It's all in the Word. And all that's highlighted just in one one little section. So... What can we conclude about this set of eight verses and its application to us? So, two things. Prayer and the Word of God are absolutely indispensable in the life of a Christian. There are two, those are two things that we absolutely cannot do, about, or do without. They're, they're necessary, and so, I mean, you talk about, we talk about this in church context before, that, you know, in, in a, given, a given church, there's lots of things we could do, but there's only a few things we absolutely have to do that are not negotiable. We have to preach the Word. We have to make disciples. We have to baptize believers. We have to observe the Lord's Supper. And But then when you talk about ministry, well, what, what ministry should we do? Should we do, um, a lot of churches do upward basketball or upward soccer, or a lot of churches do uh, different programs in the community for evangelism, or maybe they do evangelistic block parties, or maybe they do... Uh, um, a food pantry or a clothes closet or maybe they you know have all kind of different ministries all kind of different things we could do and as long as we're doing them for the right reasons using um, best using our particular unique set of resources and talents and people in our geography what makes us unique as a church that's what we're looking for so as long as we're doing that then there's plenty of things we could do. We just have to make sure we're doing the things that we have to do in order to be called, truly called a church that follows Jesus and the Word. And so on a personal level, there's lots of things we could do as Christians that would honor God. But there's some things as Christians that we absolutely have to do. And two of those things are prayer and reading and studying and meditating on, memorizing the Word, being in the Word. Those two things we can't do without. And there's other things, you know. If you're going to be a, uh, an obedient Christian, that we need to be telling people about Jesus. We need to be uh, enjoying the uh, fellowship of a local church. And so those things are we, sh we should be doing. But we can't do without prayer. We can't do without a Bible. You know, th those are foundational to the Christian life. Not to mention the fact that comfort and consolation are found in the Scriptures. 
wise counsel is found in the scriptures. So we should be praying, among other things, that God would be uh, increasing our desire for the word. We, we want to get to the point or move toward the point to where we are all able to declare verse 20. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. That's, that's the goal. We want to be consumed with, I've got to have the word. If I, if I go through a day and I hadn't been in the word, then I'm, I'm just out of sorts. You know, I'm messed up because I hadn't spent time in the word. It should be at that, to that extent where something is, is just, just feels terribly wrong if I have not spent time in God's word. Let me pray.